Hi everyone, um, thanks Ope for having me. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay, so thanks for having me Ope. Hi everyone for joining the session. Um, I'm Esther Indero. I had my bachelor's um, in economics um, from Obafemi Law University, that's in um, Ocean State, Nigeria. And um, I had my master's um, in technology management um, from the North um, Carolina a and State University, that's in Greensboro, North Carolina, here in the United States. Um, I graduated um, December 29th. It's really, really recent. Um, before I left Nigeria, I was a chartered accountant from the Institute of Chartered Accountant um, of Nigeria. But currently, I'm actually a business technology consultant at um, Delight Consulting um, LLP. And I'm also a techpreneur because um, act I'm like a C CEO of um, a startup which is called Trek Scooters, launching in Nigeria pretty, pretty soon. And I'm also um, an advocate when it comes to mental health. I'm big um, when it comes to mental health. So if I'm not doing anything professional, you can always catch me in the mental health um, advocacy space. And also I like run like an NGO by the side, you know, um, called Eclat Foundation. Um, I love photography, traveling and volunteering, you know, just giving back to humanity. Like those are the things I do, okay? So, yeah. Um, when we talk about um, graduate school, many people, we all want to go to grad school, but I feel like we need to break down like the cost because we're talking about um, graduate funding. So what does it entail? When you talk about graduate funding, what does it entail? So the first thing to note is that tuition and fees, that's the major part. That's what everybody sees. But sometimes, depending on the country you are, I know in the United States, you have to pay for insurance. When I got my application let, um, admission letter, I thought I was going to be paying a particular amount, right? That was what I had in my head until I got to school and I realized that there's a particular amount for insurance I had to pay, which was about over a thousand dollars, you know, so that's important. So um, depending on the country you're going to, you want to like you want to um, ascertain the kind of cost you've been incurring when it comes to grad school. So for the U.S., you can always count on tuition and fees, insurance, housing and feeding is also a big thing. You know, you want to consider, do you have people here you want to stay with or, or you can, you um, maybe you're going to make enough money when it comes to funding that you'll be able to cater to that. And also there will be miscellaneous, you know, since things will always come up that you have to settle as you go by. And um, what are the possible funding sources? Based on my experience, I've outlined um, about six possible funding sources for um, grad school. Number one is research assistantship. You hear a lot of people talk about RA. Um, a lot of our speakers said something about that. So research assistantship is one thing. Teaching assistantship is another thing. Tuition remission is another thing, depending on the school you're going to. Some schools, give tuition remission, you know, tuition remission. When I say tuition remission, what I mean is um, the school tries to pay or cater to a particular or some percentage of your total tuition or fee for the semester. So that's tuition remission. Sometimes departments and call it support fund. Some departments have like support funds. Um, for some of my friends in North Carolina in State University, um, depending on the department, so sometimes they just see a particular amount you know, in their account, they just notice that their balance has reduced by a particular amount, you know, and when they do the tracing, they realize that maybe their department or college put in maybe $2,000 or $3,000 for them just to support them. Also, they're like on campus jobs, you know, that you can do on campus, put the money together and then, you know, use that to pay your fees and also their external scholarship and awards. A lot of um, previous speakers said something about external scholarship awards. So, like, aside from the or outside the four walls of your university or the school you're going to, there are scholarship and awards you can actually take advantage of. So, up quick, I'll go to the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, so um, when it comes to requirement or when people talk to me about um, schooling in the US and how they should go about it, I most time um, kind of break this down into three different parts, um, which are pretty important. So for me, there's the pre-application research, which is the first phase. Um, the second phase is the post-admission research and the th third phase is external funding resources. So when we when I talk about pre-application research, um, what I'm trying to say is that before you apply or before you like 
say you want to go to a particular school, you want to um, go for a particular program, you have to do your research. Um, based on my understanding or my experience, um, when I was trying to get into the United States for my master's program, I got to realize that um, different schools um, are entitled to different um, research grants, maybe from the government or from different institutions. So some institutions are well funded than the others. So it's easier for you to get a research assistantship or maybe a teaching assistantship in a particular institution than get that in other institutions. So that's what you want to look at, look out for. One of the things you want to look out for, you know, aside from what other speakers have, have spoken about, you know, writing your statement of purpose and all of that. But one thing I tell people is like, you also want to consider the school. Does the school have funding for me? And if they do have funding for me, like, what are the um what courses do they fund so um based on my understanding with north carolina a and state university where i finished from um i had a friend that was guiding me through my application process and based the, i had a bachelor's in economics right and i was a chartered accountant i was working in a different space and my friend was like if you want to come to the us and you want to get funded and maybe in this school then you have to do a stem course because those are the courses that get funded so when i say stem i'm talking of science technology engineering and math courses and i was like oh but i don't have um like my background was is not in any of this but i was like okay i love my background then i had to look for a particular course that can um match the stem space and i can also match my current um let me say career path which was like finance business strategy and i did my research and i realized that technology management is like a blend of you know technology and business and is also classified as them um also a friend of mine thought talk talked to me about industrial management and there was analytics too so those were the three different courses um or three programs i actually applied to to three different universities right so like i did my research i knew that if i came to the if i come to the united states or in to that particular school for a master's in economics, which was my bachelor's, I probably would not be getting any funding at all. And I didn't have money to see myself through school. So I needed a course with funding and which was also gonna align with my passion. So I went for technology management. So I, I sometimes ask people that, okay, you also want to establish this fact, you know, what are the courses or like, um, what courses or what programs am I, is it more prone to get funding, you know? And which school also give funding? Also, sometimes I just want to chip this in, like based on what, um, what would I call it? Based on what your plan is after school. So I also, my friend asked me, it was like, so once you're done with school, do you want to go back to Nigeria? Do you want to gather experience? And I was like, I want to gather experience. And it was like, oh, sometimes it's better to get, do a STEM course because doing that STEM course, doing something like that in the United States, I'm not talking about other other states or other countries, but in the United States, you um, you um, better positioned, you know, into getting, you know, jobs, you know, like technology job or science based job, you know, if you're doing other courses, you might like the probability is really slim, you know. So those were the things that formed my choices when it came to um, like the courses I was going to or the program I was going to go for and the school I was going to, you know, choose also. And that actually paid off because getting in i was able to get funding you know and i was able to go through grad school without paying little or nothing for my pocket right so that's the pre-application research part and also um, when it comes to pre-application research after you've um after you've come to the realization that this is the school you want to go to there are also deadlines so there are priority deadlines so there are deadlines in which you have to submit your application for you to be considered for funding right um I applied to the University of Iowa then, and during my interview, my interview, my final interview with um, the international office, or maybe the program coordinator for the course I wanted to do, I asked her for funding, but she was like, I applied late, and now they had maybe little or nothing to give to people coming in for the program. She was like, she has already, all she already allocated the funding they had, you know, to people that applied earlier, and so if i had applied earlier there was a possibility that i would i could have gotten maybe 100 percent or 80 percent paid you know and i would be good so you also want to put into consideration where when is a priority deadline for for the school and for this particular course so all of this comes um into um base when we talk about pre-application research so um going to post-admission research so 
for me i got my admission letter for some people um once they get the admission letter they, they get funding right but for me i didn't get funding i just got my admission letter that i was admitted into the program so now i had to like think where do i get funding from right so these were the three things i had to do departmental research and engagement so i was coming into the department of technology management i had to do like a research and lecturers in my department so for you if you're looking for funding you want to look at okay you get into a particular school and your program so you want to focus on the lecturers in that department what is their area of specialization and what is their ongoing research project because most times this lecturers or these instructors actually have research they're working on and they need students to work on that project with them and they have funding you know so if you're lucky to get on a research that research can pay for your tuition or that research can pay for other things like your tuition and they can also, can also pay for your stipends right so you have to engage these lecturers after engaging them you just don't walk up to a lecturer and say that um i'm interested in this you also want to say that this is what i'm bringing to the table because a lot of lecturers have a lot of people approaching them right so you want to stand out and say okay this is what i'm bringing to the table based on maybe this is was what i did in my bachelor's i have the skills i realized that you're working in this particular pro working on this particular project if i come on this project you know i think i can bring the skills to the table and maybe i'm also a fast learner you just want to upsell yourself just think about it like you're doing an interview you're going for an interview you have to sell yourself so you also want to do the same thing to the lecturers and that way it's possible for you to even secure your research assistantship before even resuming because um there was a friend of mine or a friend's brother that did this he got admission without funding then he reached out um to um to a professor in the in his um program or his department and he spoke about the research the professor was doing and how he did that in his bachelor's and what he's currently working on and with that he was able to even get like a research assistant before he even came to school and it was fully paid you know so that's one of the things you can do after you get your admission the other things like connect with your departmental head or program coordinator now you have admission so you can go to your program coordinator or your departmental head and say oh i have admission um but i'm an international student what are the funding opportunities available to international students in this department sometimes it might be teaching assistants because you're a grad student so you can actually shadow another lecturer or a professor and help with maybe grading you know, or help like going to the class once in a while, help with undergrads, you know, that way you're getting paid too. So you can be teaching assistantship that is available in the department. And time time is really important because um, in the US, most times it's done on first come, first serve basis. So there are a lot of people trying to um, compete for the same opportunity. So you want to make sure that you get yourself in the pool first and before the deadline. So you, you can reach out to the departmental head or program coordinator and this way they can tell you oh these are the fundings that are um, available and um you can work with that i can remember i actually did um, a teaching assistantship in and outside my um department during grad school so there was this um for a, for a semester i actually worked as a teaching assistant in which i shadowed a particular professor in my department and i got paid for it so that helped with my stipend you know for the semester yeah, so that's one thing you might want to consider. Yeah. Can we go to the next slide, please, okay? Okay, yeah. Um the third one is or the second one is school wide research and engagement. So um it's different um different strategies for different schools. So that's why I say yeah, I talk I'm big on research and engagement, right? So you want to go to or you want to do a like a school wide research on the school you're going to because aside from your department aside from the college in which you just got your admission like the school itself might have um, scholarship opportunities or it might have funding opportunities for grad students right for me um in my school what i took advantage of was the tuition remission so when i got into the school i never knew about tuition remission right but in my engagement with other people i realized that tuition and um tuition um remission is available you know to students so let's say you have this funding opportunity or you um your research assistant somewhere you are entitled to maybe about six thousand k every six thousand dollars every um semester you know imagine having about 40 percent or 50 percent of your 
institution taken care of, you know, just by the school funding opportunity. If I never knew about this, I would not have taken advantage of this and I would have been, you know, stressing myself out, like looking for other ways to get funding. So I had to like, like do this, my school-wide research and engagement. And that way I was able to know that, oh, there's this tuition remission available for me and I can take advantage of that. So whatever school you're going to, you want to make sure that you're doing your research to know that what funding opportunities are in the school and like available for students that I can take advantage of. And that way you're able to do that. Okay, um, the next one is network, network, network. Like. I'm big on networking because um, as an international student, you know, you're coming to a new country, you really don't know the terrain, you don't know what's happening there. But the good news is that there are other people that have also walked that path. There are other international students in that same school, you know, that probably got full funding. So that's why I'm big on networking, networking and networking. That way you're able to take advantage of um college days of other people that have worked their shoes. So it's easier for you rather than you navigating um, the terrain yourself. You can, people can tell you, oh, this particular professor in your department has um, funding. So you don't just cast your nets everywhere. You just cast it to where it's going to be productive. And for me, when I got into this program, when I got to school, I had to like do my networking. So I went to, um, let me say people that I was familiar with. So in this case, it was Nigerian professors. So I like searched the database for Nigerian professors in my college and I was um, opportune to meet this particular professor. And I told him about my situation. I, was like, I got this admission, but I don't have funding. And he was able to link me and my one of my other friends to a new professor that was coming into the institution. So I could have searched the school database for professors that had funding, but this um, um, professor was new. She was coming from another university and our information was not on the school database. So there was no way I would have known that she had funding. So she was one, he was one that told us that this professor had funding and he took us to this professor in, um, himself and told her that yeah that we're coming from nigeria he could vouch for us you know we had to like send um what's the name send our our resume and all of that but it was based on that network i was able to get my research assistantship you know and it has also worked for some other of my friends you know the existing international students would tell us that um there's this teaching assistantship available in this particular department or this department are looking for people and they have funding and we will all just go there and take advantage of that um, of that opportunity. So networking is really, really key. And the last thing I'll talk about is external scholarship and awards. And um, a lot of other speakers spoke about this already. Like outside of the school walls, there are external scholarship and awards. So I know National Society of Black Engineers in the United States and Society of Women Engineers in the United States, they have scholarships that they give to people, you know, maybe every semester or maybe every year. You can take advantage of that. Society of Manufacturing Engineers. So there are a lot of domains and a lot of associations and organizations that, you know, that actually give all of this external scholarship and award. So you want to cast your net outside of the school to like take advantage of all this scholarship and award. And I have a couple of friends that they've been fortunate to get, you know, some funds, you know, like very good money from external scholarship and award. So aside from what other um, speakers have spoken about, which is about having a good CGPA, having a good um, statement of purpose, which is really, really important to get your feet in the door and having all of those things. I feel like like some of the tips I've shared would also help, you know, in getting funding. Let's say you don't get, you didn't get funding, you know, with your admission letter, just like my case, I didn't get funding with my admission letter. But I still went to grad school, debt free. Yeah. Okay, um, okay, can we go to the next slide? So schools with possible funding for international students. Um, I actually drafted this list with um, with a friend of mine, which is really big on you know funding in the, in, in the international um, in the United States. And Purdue University is a school that is known for its funding. My school that I finished from, which is North Carolina A and State University, yeah, you get funding, but that's based on the department you are in, you know, or the college you are in, which is really important. Like I said earlier. Um, University of California, Santa Barbara, that's another school that, you know, is big on funding for international students. 
South Dakota School of Mines and Iowa State University. That was the university um, I was going to go to, but I changed my mind and I went to North Carolina A&M State University. So they also have funding because they're going to give me a particular amount, but um, I applied pretty late. So the amount they were offering was really low as at that point. So I went to another school instead. So um, I'm open. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat box. We would reply, but my email is also there in this presentation. So you can reach out to me or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn if you just want, um, maybe you have extra questions or you just want clarification or recommendations. I would be really glad to help with that. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm okay. We have like all these because I have a lot to say. Like it's and I know we're doing with time, like with time, we are not doing so good, but if you bear with us, we just want to like make sure we are able to give you all this information at once without having to revisit this all the same type of topic again. So now moving on to the next person from US, that's Miriam. Near my hair. Hi, Miriam, are you there? Come on, not again. Miriam, are you there? No, we can hear you. If you're on mute, can you take yourself off? Mm -hmm. Oh, can you guys oh, hear me? Hear me? <laughs> Hello? Yeah, it's better now. We can hear you. Okay, all right. Sorry. Okay, um, so hi everyone, my name is Miriam Fofana. Um, I am from Ivory Coast. I started college in Ivory Coast, so I went to the International University of, of Korean Basam, where I stayed over almost like two years over there. Um, and then I transferred to Georgia State University and I was studying finance and actuarial science. So I graduated with my math, with my undergrad in finance and actual science, and then right after that, I interned at Mills on Wheels, which is a non which was an, which is a nonprofit business. Um, that was my first real work experience in the U.S. And then after that, I was able to intern at Porsche Cars North America, which was mostly in accounting. Now, when I was doing my internship, that's when I I started thinking about grad school. And then I made my decision. Then I went back to school to do my um, my master's in in, um, in quantitative in quantitative risk analysis and management again at Georgia State University. Um, I also work right now for Bank of America as a, a quantitative uh, associate. Uh, last summer, I was lucky enough to be chosen among the 1,000 students in the U.S. to attend the Forbes Under 30 Summit. Uh, when I'm not working or studying, I love to travel. I also love to meet new people. Uh, I don't think I have any hobbies, but I think that I guess that's all for me. And I also last year I was working for Heritage Furniture. Now, uh, when I was when I start when I started to think about grad school, I knew that I knew that I did not have the money to afford grad school. When I was doing my undergrad, I I promised myself that. I would not let my parents pay for grad school, so I would find a way for me to fund my master's degree. So I started looking at like um, at different ways on how I was going to be able to fund my master's degree. So, and I think you know, for you or for anyone who wants to start, uh, who wants to go to grad school, that's that should be your first way, you know, to be able to find out what I, what is available for you in terms of money. Now, so one of the first uh, sources that I, I, I found was uh, uh, those external scholarship. Well, those it's you know it's any scholarship that you can be able to have that is not uh, related to your school. You know, usually they are sponsored by a corporation or private or private organization. 
So, you know, just 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 so you know, I was able to get one scholarship like that. It was from Beta Gamma Sigma. Uh, it was only 1,000, you know. I think you use those scholarships just to be able to, um, you know, to help you with your living costs, but that's, but that's not, you know, really to help you fund your entire master's because it's not really a lot of money. Now, I also was looking at the, the department scholarship or the internal scholarship. So those are mostly, you know, any scholarship that you can be able to apply based on the department that you pursue your degree in or any scholarship that is available for the entire school, you know, for any students, basically. So I also applied for some. I was able to get one, which was not really a lot of money, you know. The first year, I only got about 400 for my first year. Then my second year, I got about 1,500. And again, this is only to help you, you know, with your other costs, not really for tuition, you know, because it's, it's not really, you know, the money wasn't that much for me. Now, the next way for you to be able to fund your master's degree will be through assistantship. Honestly, I feel like in the in the U.S., you know, most of the grad school programs, uh, they have, you know, those positions to help you fund your master's, you know, and I would say, that's, you know, that's one of the way for you. I would say one of, like, I would say in, in, in the majority of the schools, that's, you know, the way where you can get much funding, right? So I was also looking at assistantship. You know, there are two types, you know, there are um, research assistantship, then there are also, there are also teaching assistantship. When I was going to school, actually, I was able to afford my master's degree to a TA position, you know. Now, the way I apply, well, I, first of all, I was, there is, every school has like a website, you know, where you can go and then apply for any job that you want to apply, right? Uh, but to be honest, for me, I think maybe I was a bit late in the game. So, because I was late, you know, when I apply, I did only one interview for another assistant that I did not get, but for this one, a friend of mine sent me an email from a professor. So basically, there are some professors that don't want to go through, you know, ten thousand, you know, to like a thousand resume, right? So they can just uh, send an email to people that they know uh, and tell them, you know, hey, I'm looking for a, an assistant for this day, you know, just you know, let me know if you know someone. So I would say. So that's why when you're applying for your grad school, it's really important to talk to people, you know, that went to that school because, you know, it can also help you, you know, get some connection there too. So I sent my resume, I did my interview, and I got the job. So that's how I was able to mostly uh, for grad school. The, there's also another way through grants and, and fellowship. Well, those ones, from what I've heard, they are very competitive, uh, and usually they are, more, they are more available for PhD students, not so for grad school. But again, I feel like if you see one thing that you want to apply, go for it, you know. At the end of the day, I think nothing is impossible. You know, it's just a matter of starting early and knowing how to apply and what to do. So you can uh, look at Fulbright sometime every, country usually they have some like a program called Fulbright where where uh, your country uh, is gonna pay for your school for your school to and then I guess you have to come back after completion of your degree you can also look into the American Association of, of University Women International Fellowship they also have fellowship for women in STEM I think so this is worth you know looking you know during your free time now, another way for you, again, to be able to afford grad school will be through your company. So let's say for right now you're working in a company and, you know, you may talk to your boss, say, hey, I want to go to, you know, to school again. And he, he or she can help you, can pay for your school. And then after completion of your degree, you're going to have to come back and work for that person again until, you know, it's a, I would say it's a, form of agreement that you have to talk with your boss. Because um, I had one of my classmates who was in, this, in the US, literally he didn't pay anything. Either his, his company paid the whole thing, even his living costs, everything was were paid for him. So that's also a good way for you to be able to fund your, uh, your master's degree or your PhD, whatever. Now, there's also this uh, other way to fund your, um, your 
your school, that is through uh, dissertation awards and scholarship. Those won't usually, you know, it's not a lot of money, but sometimes people have those type of contests where, you know, they will tell you that, you know, if you write an essay about this topic and then if it's really good, you know, they can give you like a thousand or two thousand. So I would say this is also a good way for you to get some money, you know, I mean, more, I mean, money is never enough, you know, if you can get more, why not? So that's all I have for the funding sources for you guys. Now, requirement. I'm thinking now that you have an idea of like uh, all of these resources, you know, all these costs that you can potentially apply. Now you're thinking, okay, how do, like, uh, what do I have to have? You know, what are, what are the requirements for me to be able to qualify for this? Well, one thing that you can look into is like you need to, if you're going for a grad school degree, you definitely have to have any type of undergraduate degree from, you know, a good institution, right? Um, and also to be able to get some of the scholarship, you first need to be admitted into the program, right? Because no one is going to give you the money if you're not going to that school, if that makes sense. Now, uh, for every international student in the U.S., for grad school, you need to be enrolled in at least uh, nine credit courses. So basically that is like three courses per semester. Um, because if you do not, and that qualifies for a full-time student. So as an, as an international student, you cannot go below three courses, if that makes sense. Now, as you're applying for grad school, there are some schools that really look at your GMAT or your GR is called, you know, and if you have a very high GMAT or high GRE score, you can qualify for a merit assistantship position. Uh, I know in, at, at Georgia State University, if your GRE is over three, 322, I think you definitely get like a merit assistance, assistantship, you know, position. So, you know, as you study for these, really be, have this in mind and, you know, and try to shoot, to shoot for your best, if that makes sense. Now, you know, for someone to be able to invest in your edu in your education, they have to be able to see potential, right? So you need to show them that you are a good student. And that can be shown through your GPA, right? Having a good standing GPA, usually at least 3.0, uh, that at least shows that, that you have some standards, right? That you can succeed. So it's really, it's, it's usually required for, most of the application to have at least 3.0 GPA. Also, if you are granted an assistantship, you need to make sure that uh, you maintain a 3.0 GPA through the entire time you have that assistantship. Because if you don't, they're going to, uh, you know, take that from you, so you won't have any more uh, assistantship position anymore. Because they would think that if you were, if you're not able to do well in class, it probably is because you're working. So let's just take you know that job from you so that you can focus on on why you're here. You know. Now, last thing would be uh, work require and work experience. I mean, for most of the, the the specialized master's degree, it's not required, so you don't have to have a. Um, some work experience, but if you have it, it's always good, you know, uh, it's definitely a plus to your application, but again, it's not required, so just, I uh, just have to say this. So I'll move to the next uh, next point now, which, which are my tips. So I know all of the other speakers, they say that already, but I'll, I have to say this again, you need to start early. You have to start early. Uh, for me, because when I was doing my master's degree, I was already in the U.S., so things went faster a little bit, right? But when, but before I came to the U.S., when I was still an undergrad student, when I had to apply from Ivory Coast, you know, it took time. It took time to send my document, receive them, and so I would say start early. Start early because um, you don't want to be able, like, you, you don't want to get a good opportunity and then have to wait for that, you know, and maybe lose that uh, opportunity. Also, when you start early, it gives you time to explore multiple programs. You know, I would not, I would not advise you to only pick one choice, you know. Look at different programs, you know. Look, you know, go online, check, check the, the ranking, and, you know, pick different programs that you're interested in, and then do your research. And again, Google, I think at this point, it's our best friend to all of us, right, because we all just Google pretty much every day, right? So yeah, do your your research. Now, uh, I also think it's good to send emails to the 
recruiters for those programs. You know, sometimes you may have some question, or maybe sometimes you want to know whether a particular school is having uh, some scholarship, and you're not sure. So you don't want to apply with your money and then find out that they don't have any scholarship for you, S send an email, that's really good. When I was um, thinking about grad school, I wanted to go to a school in Canada and um, I wasn't sure if they had any type of full scholarship. So I emailed someone from that school, I find that email online, I emailed that person and I was told that they don't have any scholarship. So I was like, good. And I knew that I would not apply there because I knew that I could not pay for my school, so I wanted to go to a school that uh, had you know, enough money for me, if that makes sense. Now, also, it's a good it's a good thing to connect with for alumni from your program, just in case you want to have like a, like a different perspective on the program, you know, from the students. You can talk with them. You can ask them, you know, how easy was the program, you know, how were the courses. You can also talk to them about like uh, the, you know, the job placement. <laughs> Like is it easy is it for you to find a job after that? So those are something that's very important, you know, for you. Uh, now also, you know, you need to make sure that you write a powerful statement. You know, people are gonna read your essay, so so you have to make sure that as they read that, they that essay reflects all your values, all your your skills, and all your interests. You know, and so I would say, uh, you know, it's important to have a powerful statement and ask your friend or ask people that you think they are very good to look at your essay for you if you don't if you want to you also need to have a good resume you know because your resume highlights your you know your work experience your school that you went to your skills and anything any type of, uh, of skills that you have will be on your resume so you need to make sure that you took the time to highlight everything that's important to you and that will be important to uh, whoever is going to review your application. And I know also I forgot to mention this point, but also when, when you're doing your research, take the time to really find out what course um, you know you want to study, you know, and look at all of the you know the good, bad, the good thing and also the bad thing about the program as well. And also just not just I don't want to forget that too. When you apply, you're going to have to um, wait for your I-20, and that I-20 is going to help you come to the U.S. So basically on the I-20, it's going to have information about what program you apply. Also, you have information about uh, how, much, like how much the program is going to cost and, who's going, and who is your sponsor as well. And that can take time. So I would advise you at least, you know, apply at least, you know, four or five months before, you know, your program starts if you can. Um, I believe that I've stayed uh, enough, especially I know I know there's not much time, and I I, I don't want to also repeat what the other speakers already talked about. So I would say at this point, honestly, you all said to apply, go and apply now. You know you got this. Um, so these were my all my tips. That I, oh, I forgot one thing. Oh wait, no, I think I did. Oh, I'm sorry, I did it. <laughs> so um. Also, yeah, so these are some of the schools that they have some type of uh, funding, you know, they have a assistantship or other scholarship. So I think it's worth looking at those, uh, you know, during your free time, you know, just go and look. Um, and I, I don't want to, I, I want to end by saying that, you know, research is very important, you know. People can tell you, okay, uh, this or that, but you need to really take your time to go online and research every school that you are interested in, you know, because you want to get the right information so that you can make the right decision. I, I hope I was able to, you know, to inform you about something. I hope you learned something, you know, from my conversation. And if you have any question, please, please, you can email me. You, I, I love to talk to people. And so, yeah, thank you so much for having me in here. And it was a pleasure. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Okay, I'm I'm so we're so so sorry we are beyond time. Like I can't say so much about that. But please bear with us. Now we'll be moving on to question and answer very quickly. And the first question is how do I get an editor for my application or who qualifies to be in such position? If one of the speakers can actually help with that, please.
how do I get an editor for my application? Who qualifies to be in such position? And I think, what's her name? Mm, Chidima already mentioned something. Give a name, possible agent, AES. And I think there are more online. You can actually check online as well. Um, this is Amma. I would want to say that you can also give it to somebody you trust. Um, if it's an old lecturer that you know and you trust this person's judgment, you can possibly give it to this person. I like doing peer reviews a lot. And so I give it to friends to also read through. These are friends that you trust, not friends that would steal your ideas or make you look like you're doing something stupid, whereas they are actually picking from you. So you can do any of these things as well. Thanks, Emma. Another question here is, the person said, can I apply to different universities at the same time? I'm going to take that. Yes, of course. Sure, you can apply to as many universities as you want to at the same time. But bear in mind, some of these schools require you to pay application fee, like $75, $50, $150. So if you think you're brilliant enough, you have all this money, you can as well apply to as many schools. And there is another question here that was asking basically, are we to be bothered about not entering into any of the top schools? I think what this person is asking is like, should you feel bothered that you're not in a top school? No, you shouldn't. Yeah, and I agree. No, you shouldn't. I mean, what is it that you want? Is it the education that you need or what else do you actually want the fame associated with being in the um, popular schools, well, or famous schools? It's good if you get admission there, but it's equally very good as well to go to other um, less known schools to get what you really desire, to better your career and yourself professionally, yeah. Yeah, and I think I could um, talk about that too. Um, abroad is not like Nigeria, where you have to go to the top schools. And like, as far as you have a degree from a reputable university, that's it. And also, apart from the top schools, it also depends on the program. Like, my school isn't known as a top school, but the criminology program in the school is widely um, renowned. So. Thank you. And one other question is, must our referees be from our department or our previous school? What if we were not close to any of our lecturers? Um, your referees could be your previous, if you wrote a thesis in your final year of your undergraduate, that could be your referee. If you wrote a seminar, that could also be your referee. And even if you didn't do any of that, some of your lecturers that you did well in their classes, write an email, or if you can meet them physically, talk to them and explain that um, you're applying for admission and if they'll be willing. If they are willing, they'll let you know, and then you can use them as well. You don't necessarily have to be close with them. And I would not advise you using family members because you didn't do any research related to your um, masters with them. You just have personal relationship and that may not really help. And to add to that, some of the schools actually have their requirements when you're uh, submitting your application. They do put it there that, oh, we want professional um, referees, we want academic referees. So if it's asking you for academic referees, I think it would be better for you to at least try your best. You might not have been close with them when you're in school, but nothing stops you from walking up to them. Of course, they can always dig out your, if at least you took one of their courses or maybe one or two of their courses is okay or is enough to be able to like prove yourself and let them know who you have. Of course, maybe they have database of your result and how they can always go back and see how well you perform. And again, the way you actually bring up this conversation also helps. Another question here is, I think we should come up referees. Mm, I 
I mean, I think here the judging criteria you use for the essay, and I think you can reach right. out to Amina. Amina, you can speak yeah. on that. Yeah, the person should please reach out to me. And that particular criteria was um, actually specific to the Commonwealth Shared Scholarship. So that was a selection criteria for that particular scholarship. So you can't use that selection criteria for other scholarships. So you can get me one or two tips that might cut across other scholarships. But every, every point in that particular criteria was specific to the Commonwealth Shared Scholarship. So you can reach out to me on my email and I would be happy to share that particular document with you. But just know it's for this um, Commonwealth Shared Scholarship. And who knows, it might have been updated. This was um, in 2015. Thank you. One other oh. question here is, do any scholarship cover both visa and flight fee? I will take that. Actually, um, what's her name? Chidima mentioned a school, if I'm right. I think you mentioned a school where fund, they give you, they fund your visa, they fund your flight, and they fund your uh, tuition as well. And to add to that as well, I also, um, as, um, I'm also a MasterCard for, um, MasterCard, MasterCard scholar. Actually, they also funded both my visa, my flight, and my school, kind of, my, my school, kind of. So you might actually want to look into my uh, MasterCard, they fund, your bachelor's, they fund the master's. If you want to go to the length of PhD, they will do that for you. Like they can fund three of your different grad school, like from bachelor's to master's to the PhD. But there's one clause to it. They expect you to go back to your country at the end of the whole program or time, uh, at the end of the whole thing, which oddly people do, people don't do the last part of it. Hello, Pei. I would also want to add that um, for Canada, the Global Affairs Canada also does that for students, funding your visa, your flight here. And like you mentioned earlier, it's, you are also expected to go back to your home country after completion. So if that's something people are interested in, they can ex explore that option. Thank you. Another uh, question, yeah, like there's a question very important question. It's also it's a question that bothers me as well. I'm sorry we have uh, we have a little bit behind time, but this question actually helps you to get more information better than what all the speakers have spoken about, which is more of more of requirement. And this question is a uh, is particularly for Canada. Is it possible to? Sorry. Okay. What are the ways to connect with school advisors? And like I would add to that question, personally, when I tried applying to Canada, the biggest problem was reaching um, these advisors actually replying your messages. I don't know. And it's very fond of Canada, Some most schools in Canada for you to, they will tell you you must have an advisor even before coming to Canada itself. How do you think people can actually go about this, like trying to reach out to advisors and also getting the, getting, a response from them, even if it's not positive, at least. Um, Amma, do you want to take this? I can take it. Um, so it's very possible, and like Ope mentioned, you might get disappointed. So the only tip I can share is to be very constructive with your email or however you're reaching out to them. So the first message you're sending out to them, let it be as informative as possible. So you want to let them know what your goals are and what your strong points are. When you do that, they might be um, impressed and follow up with the application. Otherwise, you may not even hear anything from them again. So if there's an instance where you reach out to a potential supervisor and they do not respond, after a while, don't do that immediately. After a while, you can follow up. Let them know that you already sent an earlier email and you're patiently waiting for them to respond. That's how I got my first um, scholarship. The person, my supervisor, he didn't respond at first. It was after like um, two weeks. I followed up with another email and then he responded and um, eventually I agreed. I got a scholarship and then I applied for admission and I did the program. Yeah, and also remember that no one owes you anything. So in your email, you have to state what you're bringing to the table. Why should they take you on? Like, because they're going to be the ones pushing your agenda forward. They're going to be the ones, in some cases, they're going, is actually from their 
own funding from their research funding that they would fund you so you have to let them know in your email what you're bringing to the table it has to be a reciprocal relationship and you have to be polite thank you okay so one other question i have here is it possible to get funding even before getting your admission i'll kind of take that extensively using my own experience to answer that question so when i was applying for my home grad school i wanted to go into data science like i was so much interested in data science which is more or less like me studying either computer science or information technology and i got to know about the school north carolina a and state university through my cousin's best friend who was or like he was already enrolled in IT program at that moment. So he told us the basic truth. There's no more, there's no funding in IT department. That's the truth because the, the cost is more like 80% online. They, they have more of 80% online student and 20% in student. But for computer science, they have funding. They, have, they are open to a lot of opportunities and all, but it's mainly for citizen. So now back to what I want to do. And at the same time, I'm getting money at the same time because I know I don't have the money to start to, to pay for my school fees. So at that point, I took my time to make more research on what data science is all about, which is more like you having a basic understanding of computer science, having understanding of statistics, having understanding of mathematics. And me being a math, like I, my background is mathematics. And I felt like, oh, and he told us that there's money in math department. So far you can do TA, algebra, like all these simple, simple um, college math, and you can teach all this college math and all. So I felt like, oh, I have a background in mathematics already. I have a master's, one master's in mathematics already. So why don't just go ahead and apply to take um, apply to applied mathematics department? In that way, I'm able to take my compulsory courses from the department. I took my prerequisite and um, more like required courses from statistics, and I took my elective from computer science. That way, I've been able to like combine all the three domains that make that make up data science, and I'm still being able to like I'm getting money, I'm still in my career path. What I'm trying to say is that you need to like choosing college, uh, university, choosing the course you study. They really matter a lot, and also choosing the school when it comes to money and funding. And I was very fortunate; I got funding even before coming to school like i got the money coming to school and the reason why i'm actually going to state this is, is because nigeria right now is very difficult to even get visa like for you to get the visa even after having admission just because they believe most people coming through student and become illegal in the country so for you to actually have one, like be a one step ahead of all these people i will advise you to try to make sure you at least Try your like try everything you can to get some money on your I-20 before coming. I-20 is what Miriam already told you. He has everything about you. Like it stays, it's more like what makes you legal as a student in the United States. It has your name, your information, your school, who is funding you, is it your parent or yourself? How much the school is expecting you to bring, how much you're bringing. So that actually helped me. I already have that money. I already have it on my I-20. So it kind of helped my that application as well and what i did to actually get that money before that like um esther said already i reached out to the department immediately i submitted my application like some days after i sent out two different emails one to the department and the other one to the grad school i was asking for money from grad school which i already know about the tuition remission i was asking for tuition remission from grad school and i was asking for ta or research job from my department so that actually helped me. I got I got to show the remission six thousand dollars per semester from grad school, and I also got like five thousand from my department. So that helps my I twenty. I already I was able I was confident enough to tell the whoever interviewed me at the embassy that I'm not the one going to like I'm not coming to the US to become illegal. My school is already being funded. So I would appreciate I'll reach I will advise you to please try all these methods, try all these skills, all these tips them out even before you get your admission that will help you of course you can do it after getting the admission but before admission will help you a lot and to help your visa process so for other question there's one other question here but i'm just going to tell you somebody is asking for a link for the mastercard scholarship you can reach out to me on linkedin we're not doing so well with time right now you can reach out to me on linkedin for the mastercard scholarship then i can give you more information about that and there's another, there's the last question we're going to pick here, which is more like, 
it's very easy to answer. I have a question. Now a formal level advisor for me traveled out to Canada to send. Now he's no longer my level advisor, but the fact he was my level advisor before, and now he's probably working with one of the top CV engineer, civil engineering firm in Canada. Does his recommendation stand valid? I would say yes. And if the school is asking for three recommendations, you can actually make him one of them. If the school is asking for two and you have academic, like people that are in academics and in your area of study, or maybe the school you went to before, it's fine. You can use both. You can also add him. I'm not saying you shouldn't use him, but I would tell you, it's always very good to like get recommendations from the schools you were before. I mean, this, the, your undergrad, because they know you and that's where you're coming from. That's your previous. Um, your previous school, it's actually always better to like get people from, um, from where you just finished from, better than someone you've had connection with like so many years ago. They might not be able to tell so much about you, like currently, like right now, or like someone who you currently working with and you have a better interaction with than her. So you can still use the person, but just try to like leverage the opportunity, like know when and when not to consider using him. But when I mean, I'm going to add, you know, just to reiterate what I said um, earlier on about reaching out directly to the university that you wish to apply and just making direct inquiries um, because really um, they know exactly what they want and they would be in the best position to to advise. So what I find, you know, from, from my own experience of interacting with applicants is that sometimes they are a bit hesitant to actually, um, you know, make direct inquiries or reach out. So, but while we on the other side, um, again, by we, I mean, referring again back to when I worked at the international office, I saw the enthusiasm and how really, um, how these guys are really very willing to answer whatever questions that applicants um, have. So I think it's just to just uh, uh, re-emphasize the importance of actually just writing them directly if you've got any queries, um, which for the UK, I think the best, the best uh, avenue to go around it would be the international office. And if they don't have the answer, at least they can then refer you to um, who would be able to answer if you've got any uh, questions regarding the, the application process. Thanks, Judima. We actually, we're out of time. If you, I'm just gonna say thank you all for joining. Like I know it took a lot of your time, like it's past the time we actually have to to hand the program. But if you are looking for a mentor, like I said already at the beginning, this is brought to you by STEM Girls Initiative. If you need a mentor, you can reach out to us via any of our in, through email or you can connect with us on Instagram and we will share more information about the program with you. And if you have any other question, please feel free, free to reach out to us on LinkedIn. Like, I mean, search for our name. My, my name on LinkedIn is just my name, Opoemi Olawi. Just reach out to us and from there, we can actually answer more of your questions. Thank you, Vero. Thank you, Ho, for joining. Speakers, I really wanna say thank you, Ho. It was really, really insightful for me as well. You're welcome. And thanks for having us. Thank you.